Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we discuss the week's hottest legal topics. Up this week, we have married politics and the law. So we've got the Democratic National Convention that has been going on this week that we are speaking. We will probably publish this next week when you hear it, but we're going to do a quick recap of what happened at the convention. What is going on with all the definitions? What are delegates? What's the voting process? Why did some delegates abstain from voting? Is that even allowed? What's the difference with the president versus the vice president? So we're going to get into some fundamental constitutional definitions and rules that are also not constitutional, but not outside of the Constitution, um, or at least outside of the parameters and ideas of the Constitution. So that's what we're going to get into this week. We're also going to talk a little bit about a Disney case because we're, you know, we're the law the law forum here. We talk about the law, and this is a little odd, off the beaten track kind of case. So we're going to talk about this Disney case and a couple other things along the way. I'm Virginia Tarani. I am the owner of Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer till you do. We operate in Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, mostly focusing on accident injury law. I also am the CEO of The Law Unscripted, and we host The Legal Weekly Wine, as well as The Law Unscripted Podcast, and we have supplemental bar prep programs. So if you go to thelawunscripted.com, we focus on the eight core subjects of law school that are taught with every bar class and some undergraduate classes. Dr. Vile, who's on here with us, who's a co-host of The Law Unscripted and The Legal Weekly Wine, you have actually taught constitutional law as one of your undergraduate classes, right? For many, many years, yes. Two it, semesters. Yeah, two semesters worth. I know it was required. I took them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it made you a better person. It did, actually. It really did. So, yes, Dr. Vile is now the dean of the Honors College at Middle Tennessee State University. He is an expert in political science, the Constitution, the amending process, and constitutional law. And you did, for, for decades, you taught two semesters of constitutional law to undergraduates. And I will tell you, as someone who went through the program um, and graduated with a, a bachelor's in political science, pre-law emphasis, it really did help me for law school. I felt like I had a leg up on other students who had come and never even talked about the Constitution or constitutional law. They'd never heard of Miranda versus Arizona. And we had studied it in undergrad, and I felt that that was a great advantage to us. You know, if there are undergraduates listening, you don't need to take mm. a lot of undergraduate law courses. Right. But generally, if you have something on judicial process or constitutional mm -hmm. law, you know, and if you're you know, if you if you know you want to go into entertainment law and you can get a you can get something on copyright and whatever. But for the most part, law schools, they want to teach it their way yeah. and their way, which I tried to emulate. And I think a lot of constitutional law professors do at the undergraduate level is not just lecturing you as to what, a, you know, what what a court decision was, but going through the reasoning and yeah. helping you know, the Socratic method really works well for constitutional law. It really does. And I tell you, one of my favorite parts of your class, the, the second semester, I remember we had to do a paper where we had to choose one of the cases that was pending before the Supreme Court that year. And we had to write an opinion paper as to how we believed that the justices would decide that particular case. Well, actually, case. what I wanted... <laughs> was for people to tell me how it should decide. And if you if you wanted to make a prediction, that was fine. But I was far less interested in predicting, you know, who are, of course, in judicial process, and that would make sense. You'd line everybody <laughs> up ideologically. How are they likely to, to fall? But the more important is, you know, from your under, you know, from the text, from whatever methods of constitutional interpretation you would use, how would you come out on this? <laughs> It was, it was good. I, I really enjoyed it. And a lot of other antics you had through the classes for another day. That's for another um, podcast. Um, but also on here, so we also have the preeminent Chelsea Rogers, who is an attorney with Tarani Law, as well as one of our other partners with the Law Unscripted and co-host. Welcome. 
Hi, glad to be here. And while I'm here, I'm going to plug our merch Please. that I have on today. This is my new favorite shirt, guys. Um, I picked it out. Pink, obviously. We know eh, it's kind of my thing. But I'm going to like scoot back and see if we can see it. It says, in my lawyer era. Um, as Love a it. Swifty and as a, a, a baby attorney, this you're going to see me in this shirt a lot. <laughs> And it looks great on you. We love it. And yes, we do have merch now. So thelawunscripted.com, go there for merch. I'm wearing another one of our merch um, shirts. So mine says, uh, let's see, my hair's all in the way. I plead the fifth cup of coffee. Um, mine's in purple. You can get it in purple, gray, or pink right now. Um, we also finally have shirts. We've had shirts for Tarani Law, but we now have shirts for The Law Unscripted. So I'm holding up one of those. So we have our logo on the front, which is very similar to Tarani Law logo. And on the back, if you can see, we have the entirety of The Law Unscripted and its motto or logo, so to speak. So we have the logo and it says... Everything about the law you never knew, you never understood, and no one ever told you, which is what we try to do with the, the law inscripted. That's our whole motto and everything we try to teach because we didn't learn it all either. Somebody had to okay, tell us. So while, while we're talking about merch and whatever, yes. um, the two conventions, oh, you get yes. a choice between Hulk Hogan <laughs> mm. and Pink and the Chicks, previously... The Dixie Chicks. Correct. Uh, who had a somewhat unusual, a little bit different rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, which, as you know, is a, something that I've written a book on. Uh, I'm One of the books that we're going to discuss later, maybe, is this new book by Neil Gorsuch yes. on the Supreme Court called Overrule. And one of the outdated laws that he mentions, which I think actually probably should we should enforce, uh, is a law in one of the states that penalizes people for playing the Star Spangled Banner out of tune. <laughs> 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 I don't That's know funny. who makes the decision in those cases, but I thought it was a fairly fascinating law. That's great. Yeah, and um, so that's that's good. And in talking about who attended the the DNC, it was it was funny because I love pink. I, for mm. for people who know me, I I have been. I'm not obsessed with her, but I love her music and have since since the mm. late 1990s. So like 1999, 2000, I was in mock trial with with Dr. Vile and mm. one of the my teammates, they were like, oh, you really like pink? And I was like, no, no, I don't. Um, and I was absolutely in denial at the time. But now I have all of her albums. I've been to a concert. Highly recommend her concerts. They're Absolutely amazing, amazing shows. But if I were so shallow, maybe I shouldn't say it that way because I don't mean it to be derogatory. But if I were looking just for and star don't power, don't go after Swifties, please. No, Come no, no, on, no. I, I no. was named an honorary Swifty in a last <laughs> trip with the kids. So. No, and as that. you should be. And honestly, if we're looking just at celebrities, it was really interesting because the news feeds are like which celebrities showed up to which convention. Yes, and if I we're looking just at celebrities and be like, oh, I love the chicks and I love pink. If they support Kamala Harris, I'm going to support Kamala Harris. So it, it's really interesting how our culture is, which celebrities, you know, they're, they're bringing celebrities just for that reason is well, if you remember, like one. Re remember that, is it, what was it? Sheena, who, there, there was a Hollywood actor who was very influential in withholding money from Biden uh, unless Biden were replaced by Harris. Uh, you know, Hollywood is a source of money for, I mean, yeah. for both sides. Um, yeah. But the the Hulk, I thought the Hulk Hogan, I, I, I really thought I was in an alternate universe when I first saw him come on stage. For the Republican the convention. convention. Yeah, it was that was really interesting. But yeah, there was an article, there was a news article of, you know, which celebrity showed up for which one. And there was Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock versus Pink and the Chicks, um, Oprah Winfrey. So th it was yeah. really interesting to see which stars turned out and how will that affect the voting. A and I think it is really indicative because even even if I hadn't already decided, as clearly I have on this show, people know, but there is a strong, oh, well, I really like Pink. I like what she says. I support her as a strong woman, as an artist, um, as a mother. 
And to see her there is very inspiring. Same with Oprah. Oprah's mm. on. Oprah, oh, by the way, is a uh, cat lady, right? A, a motherless cat and, lady. And a childless way, cat, Oprah, cat lady. According to Vans. Oprah was very su- significant <laughs> in endorsing Obama when it was against, when it was Obama versus Clinton. And a lot of people believe oh. that she was, she was, you know, one of the more influential deciders in that. Oh, so she has had now, but what was what was fascinating about particularly the Democratic convention, you, and this is not altogether new, but you have Republicans for uh, uh, for Harris, um, and there was something else very insightful that I had in mind. <laughs> I wonder what it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, that Winfrey identified herself not as a Democrat but as an independent, mm. and I'm assuming that's the case. Uh, so I thought that was, you know, sort of you, you would particularly, you know, African-Americans tend to, to be much higher party identification generally with African-Americans. And I would have thought particularly with her support of Obama that she would have been a registered Democrat. But according to her speech, she was an independent. Yeah. And it was it was interesting. She was I'm trying to find I'm not just looking on my phone. I'm trying to find I, I took different pictures of things. Um one of my favorite statements, did I take it? Did I do it? She made a comment about the cat woman, the, the childless cat y- woman. Yes, that we would save, if the house was on fire, the neighbors would save not only the woman, but also the also cat. Also her cat, could. yes. I, I'm not, I would not go into a burning building to save a cat, but <laughs> hopefully I would if there were a woman or, or, or man child. Yeah, I thought that was very cleverly done where it was a that little was. bit of a poke where, hey, we're so magnanimous. We're, and it was, we're, gonna, we're not going to ask you what religion you are. We're not going to ask you what race you are. We're going to go in and save you and your cat too. Um, so I thought that that was well done. So okay. the best line at the convention, oh. I thought, and I thought Michelle, well, no, I, yeah, I thought Michelle Obama's speech was better than Barack's, although they were both okay, uh, and Michelle's particularly good. But the best line I thought from Bill Clinton was, "Don't count the lies, count the eyes." Oh, that uh, was a and, you wonderful know, make, making line. the point that one scene that Trump seems very self-centered. I thought that you know it's a good attack line to use. Yeah, and in a similar way, was it Harris who used a similar phrase of Trump has only ever been for himself, where I am for well, you. Well, that was sort of a consistent theme, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, what's interesting is yeah. she said that, that's his only client because she you know it was a oh, call back earlier in her own speech where she had said her only client have had ever been Kamala Harris for the people, um, you know, just talking about her career as a prosecutor, and she said that Donald Trump's only client has ever been himself is what the quote was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah in some that. ways, they've been able to label him better than they've been able to label her. And, I, you know, the great unknown right now is she doesn't seem to have made a major misstep in the last 35 days, which is about as long as she's been running. We got, you know, about twice that amount to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it could all collapse tomorrow. Who knows? Of course. You know, there's been something of a development. And, by the way, one of the articles that I've read, I think he's a little mistaken about the Electoral College. Robert, Robert Robert Kennedy Jr. has withdrawn and basically thrown his support to Trump. He's taking his name off the ballot in Arizona. Well, right. in in the swing states, but left it on elsewhere and told people. And his idea is somehow that he would then, if if neither of them get a majority of the electoral college, that he could still possibly be elected, but. I don't think he's going to get any electoral votes, and I don't think you get into, you know, if nobody gets 270 votes or if there were a tie there, I think it would, it's the top three candidates, but they got to have, you got to have some electoral votes before they get there. So I, I think his argument is a little bit mistaken on this, and unless I've misunderstood it. Just well, came let's, out today. Let, let's go into the Electoral College, because this is very hard to understand, even, you know, as someone, as an attorney, even as someone who studied constitutional law. So we've got, we've got two different pieces right now. We, mm-hmm. We're pre-election, so we're not in the Electoral College yet, but we still have delegates. Now, these are what, delegates to the conventions? 
Right. And, and I got this on a television program, a call and show that I was on two nights ago. Let's go historically. In early America, candidates were selected basically by congressional caucus. So people of like mind would get together and say, well, George Washington's clearly presidential material. And somebody else would say, well, he's no George Washington, but John Adams, you know, he helped to establish American independence and Pinckney's done this and Jefferson's done this. And so that system basically broke down during, during the Monroe presidency, the, the so-called era of good feelings. And shortly thereafter, in 1830, the anti-Mason party held a constitutional, they held a nominating convention. And then it became, each state would nominate, each party would send people to the convention. The convention would choose the presidency. And we have, we have sort of a shadow of that left, but the convention really doesn't do, the, the convention is eye candy. Uh, you, you know, even, even the much touted roll call of the states where every state gets, you know, it, it, in the case at least of the Democrats, that had been decided two weeks earlier. And they're just going through the motions to sort of make hoopla about it. But really the, the main choices today are made and when make, need to make a major qualification, they're made at the primary level. Because in the past, prior to the 1960s or thereabouts, most primaries were so-called, they were pref presidential preference, mm. but they were non-binding. And so you could lose the primaries, and if the party leaders wanted you in, you'd still be elected. Now, almost everybody comes to the convention with a majority of the primary votes, and they're going to get it. Now, what's different in this, this year, of course, is the person who had the majority of the electoral votes was Joe Biden. Well, is it the electoral or the primary? I, I'm sorry. The, the the person who had the most primary okay. electors and electors from caucuses was Joe Biden. And had he not stepped aside, we could have seen, <laughs> we would have had a raucous convention. But because so he was persuaded uh, to step aside, people had voted for him with the expectation mm -hmm. that Harris would be his running mate. And so she ended up with with most of his votes. So with so with those delegates who had come in, the primaries were decided. It was Joe mm -hmm. Biden. They come in. They're technically supposed to vote for Joe Biden. So what happened and what did they do? Well, with Biden's eventual consent, he threw his support. I mean, he could have. What he could have, well, he could have just continued on and say, I don't care how old you think I am, I'm going to go for it. But he also could have said, well, if I'm, if I'm not going to run, I think, you know, we ought to have a series of new primaries or new contests. Uh, it would have been very late, could have been very bitter. Instead, he said, Harris has been a good vice president. I'm going to recommend her. Now, you know, I wrote an article about this for the Well saying, uh, the Well News, saying that Despite the way we treat vice presidents, they're not co-presidents. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism of the American system that the Senate is unrepresentative, right? You get the same. Right. D Rhode Island has the same representation as California. In the and Senate. then we have, you know, criticisms of the Electoral College. That sometimes the winner of the Electoral College isn't the winner of the popular vote. But think how we choose vice presidents. Oh, uh, basically, Biden, you know, put his hand on her head and blessed her and everybody agreed. And even more so when you think about it with, I mean, Walsh, to my knowledge, has never run in a national election. Never. Right. Fa I mean, he, well, he's, he's been a governor. He's been he's been a governor. But wasn't he a senator uh, as well, though? No, he had been a rep U.S. representative. Oh, OK. Okay. But, you know, he doesn't have he we chose him, or Democrats chose him because uh, Kamala Harris sort of, you know, had interviewed people and she decided he was best. That's I'm not opposed to it necessarily. And I understand it helps to have a vice president that you agree with. And particularly. So what has Kamala Harris done the most of any president in the United any vice president who's ever sat? 
What's the Hold one on. official function that a vice president has other than being the president and waiting? Tie-breaking votes? That's right. She Get has cast nice. the most tie-breaking votes of any pre- any vice president in history, and that's in just a four-year term. Yeah. And prior to this, the two leading leaders were John C. Calhoun and John Adams. And for uh, the and audience, Adams, you would expect in the pardon is is she do, what what time breaking votes is she giving for what? So we make sure that we if, know. Okay, so she is technically a vice president is technically president of the Senate. <laughs> and by the way, that departs from the strict notion of separation of powers, mm. which is. You know, we have three distinct branches. Executive is distinct from the legislative branch. But when the vice president, who is a member of the executive branch, presides over the Senate, she's engaging in a legislative function. Mm. And because the Senate has been so tightly split between Democrats and Republicans and with an independent or two thrown in there, she has had the opportunity to cast the most tie-breaking votes. Mm. And so to, in, to that extent, at least, you do sort of know, you know, what she believes in, because you can look at what vote she casts a tie for, but she is not a co-president. Yeah. You, 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 she can't claim all the credit for what happened in the Biden administration, nor should she get all the blame, because typically a good vice president, I hope, does what sort of a good associate dean does. He gives me good advice, but... I may not take it. Sometimes I don't. Uh, and I'm the decider here in the same way that the president would be. And so it, it's, but but it's bizarre that no one seems to say, why are we choosing someone simply on the basis that a president or presidential candidate decides that they want him? Hmm. Um, and sometimes they've decided poorly, right? Oh, yes. Um, Think, you know, our greatest president maybe in history, Abraham Lincoln, chose Andrew Johnson. A disaster. Uh, and arguably, you know, Sarah Palin, Dan Quayle, uh, probably not going, you know, if there were a Mount Rushmore for vice presidents, I don't think either of them would be on it. Right. I think you can say that J.D. Vance was a terrible pick for well, Trump's candidacy. That has, <laughs> it, what's interesting about the vice presidential candidates is there's a similarity. Vance was chosen partly because of conservative credentials, but I think he's largely chosen with the thought that he's representing the poor boy from Appalachia who makes good and Mm -hmm. understands, you know, why people are dying of drug overdoses and, you know, why they're bitter and whatever. But Walsh is coming across that way, though. Pardon? I think he's that that he tries that. across that way, though. He no, seems I, I, I'm good. not sure. Right. But why he was chosen and, right. and why was, well, I mean, who would think typically, well, if you got Hulk Hogan, I guess there's nothing wrong with having a football coach, but who would typically think of having a football coach as a vice president? But he's coming across as representing, you know, Midwestern Middle people, you, you know, yeah. no farms, somebody who was a teacher somebody who's very relatable, yeah. and his speech, I think, was much more relatable probably than J.D. Vance's was. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. So with the, with the delegates, mm-hmm. let's go back to the voting. It's my understanding when there was the roll call of the states yeah. and the delegates, how did the delegates vote? What did they say? And there were a couple that were surprising. So tell us what they said and what it meant. Well, every state had to, you know, toot its own. I I don't remember what Georgian said, but I'm sure they mentioned peaches. I just feel (laughs) confident of it. And and maybe, you know, probably said peach trees to, you know, just make sure. Instead of bushes. There are any confusion about how how (laughs) funny. Watch the prior episode. (laughs) Anyway, most states will tout, you know, statesmen or a lot of them would mention their sports team. You know, uh, from from that from that dogs, uh, and particularly if they had a connection with the you know one of the nominees, they would do that. Uh, but th- these are di- right. These are different from the electoral vote. So people, when the, when you have a primary, each candidate will put forth a pe- a list of people who said that they're going to vote for them, and so they're the people at the conventions. And as you'll notice. The Democratic convention is always larger. 
It's usually about 3,000 delegates and the Republicans are usually have about 2,000. So Why? if you want to compare, it just historically, that's, that's been the way they do it. It's it's more intra-party rule. I mean, it's not constitutional e- either way. And, and, and real the quick, other my apologies is, that there are dogs barking in the background. Yeah. We're babysitting my, my in-law's dog, and he's very upset they're not here. So you're going to hear him in the background, but please continue. Um, so we're, we were talking about delegates. Yeah, the, the numbers. Right. The, the other thing is the challenging party always goes first. Mm. So Republicans hold the first convention, and oh. both parties generally get this year. But uh, and you know, if Republicans are if Trump is elected, then next year they would have the second convention. Okay. But both parties usually get a bump for from this. Um, now, I think you know Trump did get a bump. In fact, mm-hmm. you know, practically we're having a a, a celebration party by the, the end of the convention thought everything was pretty much in the bag. That's been turned upside down by the Harris candidacy. But, you know, Democrats need to know that, you know, you're going to get a little boost from this. But particularly now, you know, there are not a lot of votes left, but, you know, people are supporting Kennedy. Some of them might now switch at his suggestion to Trump. So that could mitigate a little of it. And things can go wrong. I mean, they, they always do in politics. Uh, now, and, some but, delegates, as I understand it, they voted present. Right. What does that um, mean? Well, so go back, and and I don't think you saw this in, in the Republican. My my recollection is that somebody, somebody introduced, and I don't know if it was at the beginning or the end, but they introduced a resolution that we make it unanimous for Trump. Mm. But if you remember when Trump ran, even— even after he had amassed a majority of the delegates, there were still people who were voting for Governor Haley. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, she did eventually turn her votes over. Right. But there really wasn't, there wasn't substantial opposition to, to, uh, to Biden. There was one candidate, U.S. representative, who just sort of washed out. I don't know that he got, I don't know that he got any delegates. If he did, they were very minimal. But there were a number of states, uh, in Trump's case, it was, you know, just concerns over the parties headed in the wrong direction, whatever. Biden's case, some of it was age. But the main thing that happened in the Biden case was that those who think that American su- supplying of military aid to Israel is resulting in, as in part is, I suppose, resulting in casualties in Gaza, that you know somebody should be voting for them. So by voting present, they're saying, you know, probably you know we're going to support you over the alternative, but we're really not pleased with this part of your policy. So how are we've got these delegates then for the conventions? We've right. now officially put up our two candidates for yes. the Republican and the Democratic candidates, including their vice presidential running mates. How is that then different from the Electoral College? Tell us a little bit about the Electoral College and how it differs from the popular vote and why. This is hard to understand. And even okay. as, uh, okay. it, it, yeah, Chelsea's nodding along as well. Well, you, you got to sort of go back to the Constitutional Convention and figure out, so what were their options? And initially when the, pres- the presidency emerged late in the convention, Everybody knew you needed a Congress, mm. and there's probably some sentiment for a court decision, but people weren't quite sure, do we want a singular or a plural executive? How strong should it be? They had two, they had two very contradictory visions in front of them. One was that governors at the time at the state level were very weak, often had one-year terms, often very ineffective. And on the other hand, you had George III, whom they had just rebelled against, didn't want to create a monarch, particularly a hereditary monarch. So they started out, well, Congress will select the presidency. Well, if you do that, you essentially have a parliamentary system like you would have in England. And it doesn't work terribly well with separation of powers because you would then have a president who would be absolutely beholden to the people who selected him and will decide whether to select him or not. So they tried to get around that by saying, Congress will select a president, but only for one term. 
and then that was to keep them from, you know, him from corrupting the legislature. Mm -hmm. But over time, people said, well, you know, our governors are ineffective. We need someone with greater power uh, than the governors have. And they created the president independently, and then they had to figure out how to choose him. The obvious way to do it is by popular vote. Mm -hmm. But One that's vote, obvious yeah. because we have computers, and that's obvious because we have telecommunications. And I might know a senator from New York better than I know my own, hmm. or yeah, you know, absolutely. a prominent member of the House more than I would know my local representative. And so, what they what they did is they said we'll have each state elect a number of individuals, sort of representative democracy, much like Congress. We will elect people who will choose the president for us. Mm. And then big issue, how are we going to allocate the electors? Well, we had already had a big controversy in the convention over how are we going to represent states. Right. Large populous states said it should be by population. The, the non-populous states said no, every state should be represented equally as they were under the Articles of Confederation. And the compromise is representation according to population in the House, equal representation in the U.S. Senate. So the Electoral College, when it was formulated, simply incorporated that compromise. How do we decide how many votes a state gets? Well, we'll add together their total number of representatives, which is based on population, and then we'll add two, which is how many everybody has in For the, the Senate. Senate. Okay. And so... Each, so each candidate now who wins, well, each party candidate, so Harris on one side will say, you're going to vote for this slate of people, I believe Tennessee, I should know, it's, I can't remember if it's 11 or 12, but let's say it's 11. You know, these 11 people have pledged that if you vote for them, they're going to cast their vote for me. Mm. So I'm not, I'm really voting for the electors, but I'm voting with the, ex and the same for the Republicans. That they're going so to go and vote for my presidential nominee. Right, right. Now, the Constitution mm -hmm. doesn't specify how states divvy up their electors. Oh. But right now, all but two states, well, there is, they tell you how many electors each state has, but they don't say it has to be win or take all. But all states except Maine and Nebraska, neither of which are particularly populous, cu populous currently allocate according to a winner-take-all formula. Mm. So if there are 20 million votes in California and you have 10 million and one and the other side only has 10 million, you're going to get all 50-some 60-some California electors. So no matter what, each of those specific people would have voted on their own. Well, for their the 50 people, right. If it was, it'll probably go Democratic. That's the expectation for, for California. Each of those people that you voted for when you click, if you click the Harris uh, Walsh ticket have said they're going to vote for her. Okay. But you get all the votes instead of, well, you only got 51% of the vote. You should get half. No, but that's by state dec decision. And in fact, you know, I think some states would be wise to go ahead and do what Nebraska and, and Maine have done, because if you want or, or not. You know, I think one definition of hell over the next three, two and a half months is to be living in one of these swing states. Mm. You are going to be constantly bombarded. Oh yeah, uh, with oh, yes. advertising. Well, and George is going to be one of them. I That's mean, what I was going to say. My phone. Yes. The amount of, I mean, not even just advertisements, but polls about everything you could possibly imagine texted to yes. my phone. Um, it's already started. Yeah, I think Bob. Um, we had a work retreat, and we're in Tennessee for four days. I think in that time, I probably got twenty six ish text wow. messages about. Yeah, I mean, I need to, like, and, unsubscribe. And let me warn people about something. Push polls, do we know about those? I do not. Okay. So a push poll is where basically they will say, you know, are you going to vote for the angelic Trump or are you going to vote for the devil Harris? Mm. Uh, and are you, you know, are you aware that Trump is the greatest president who's ever lived in history? 
And are you aware that Kamala Harris, you know, has four horns yes. or, or, or whatever? You know, if you get a poll that starts giving you information, they yes. don't want your opinion. They're trying to shape Sway your you. opinion. Mm. Uh, and I have nothing wrong with listening to it, but just be aware that what they tout for either candidate is not necessarily the truth. Interesting. Yes. I got an interesting one. The, the poll that I got... Um, and I went through it, was actually about, I mean, there were questions about everything, but you could very much tell what the majority of the questions were about. And it was about replacing J.D. Vance with Nikki Haley as the VP. Um, and I took That's a poll so while we were in Tennessee. And it was, I mean, there were probably 20 questions on it. And mm -hmm. 16 of them were about J.D. Vance and Nikki Haley um, and Trump. Wow. And then the other ones, I think, were just random. They were just kind of like trying to well, see. And so, right. Sometimes when, when you're being polled, yeah. what they want to know is who do they call on election day? Mm. Yeah. If they know you're not, you know, if they know you're solidly against their candidate, they're not going to call and remind you to vote. Interesting. <laughs> if they think yeah. you're on their side, then then clearly they will. Well, let's ask a question about that. So, Dr. Vile, is there a way constitutionally or rule-based for the conventions where if one of the vice presidential candidates were were to drop out or be forced out. It's happened before. Could they be replaced at this oh. point? Yes, yes. How? Is it just the president appoints somebody else? Uh, George McGovern nominated Senator, I forget that I apologize, I don't remember his first name, Senator Eagleton of Missouri, subsequently discovered that he had had some mental treatments yeah. and some other things that they didn't know. Um, and although he initially said he was a thousand percent behind him after about a week or two, I don't know if Eagleton dropped out or I think probably a combination. McGovern just said, you know, we can't win with you on the ticket. And he was replaced. Even so, though he yes, was voted in the, the convention. Well, he had, right. He had been, my understanding is it was after the convention. Wow. Um, but, and, and I, I'm sure that McGovern had to probably get, you know, party leaders would have had to agree to that, much as they had to agree to, you know, Walsh uh, being the vice presidential candidate for, for Harris. Well, let me mention something but, else. We've got a lot of, I, I've seen a lot of news articles this week say, with, with Trump saying things like, it's not fair that I'm now having to go against Harris. It should right. have been, you know, right. crooked Joe Biden. Now I'm going <laughs> against Harris. I mean, these are the words that he's using right. is, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I beat crooked Joe Biden, so now I'm having to go against Harris. Right. This isn't fair. And he's used that terminology of this isn't right. fair. And and I'm I'm having some of my my acquaintances are saying, well, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair that Kamala can just come in at the last minute and replace Joe, and maybe this isn't a fair election. And there's a lot of talk that's being, I think, stirred up now already of, well, if this is unfair already, how can Trump have a fair election? Is anything that we do from here going to allow the process to be fair? So I want to talk about that, especially yeah. related to the Constitution and to any okay. rules we have. Dr. Vile, is this replacement of Joe Biden after the primaries for which they right. voted for him, but before the convention, is that fair and allowed? Says nothing. Right. Constitution says nothing about how candidates are nominated. That's solely up to the political parties, with the exception can't have all white primaries. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are some limits on it, but by and large, each party decides if if the if Trump had I mean, the irony here is Trump's the one who told us how incompetent Biden was, right? Yes. So you would think that for the sake of the country, he would be glad that maybe he's running against someone who's a little bit younger. Right. Um, but as, and the other, you know, I, I mentioned one good line in Bill Clinton's speech, and the other good line uh, was that he was now the oldest, what was it? Yeah, the oldest candidate at the, conven the, the convention. You know, he was, he was even older, or no way. He, he was, was younger. He was younger than yes. Donald Trump. And, mm -hmm. you know, this, this. I mean, I get the personal frustration, right? You yeah. think you're running against someone you think is a loser and that loser is, and I, I use that term sort <laughs> right. of in his 
Yes. N- not because I think Biden is a loser, but you you know who who wouldn't want to run against somebody who's much older mm-hmm. and has a lot more negatives and somebody who's younger and in, and generates a lot of enthusiasm. But there's yeah. nothing illegal about it. Uh, and it's crazy. I mean, before the convention, and I know this is not, I mean, not constitutionally based, but before yeah. the convention, it's a presumptive nominee. It wasn't even like they replaced replaced the nominee right. after the convention, um, which I think is interesting. I mean, I think if people are worried about it being undemocratic, I mean, you would have to be a member of either the Republican or, in this case, the Democratic Party, and then, I mean, go change their rules and policies. And that's what that is, right? Like it's not really a legal basis. It's an organization. But if you, I mean, if you want consensus, there was now, again, the Republicans adopted a rule saying they were going to make it unanimous, but there was far greater unanimity on replacing Biden with Harris than there was on, on choosing Trump over Haley. Because even after he won a majority people were still voting sort of as a protest vote for her. Mm. So I, you know, it makes a good rhetorical argument, but there, there's nothing, you know, and this is from, I'm sorry, this is from someone who tried to steal, you know, who tried to challenge the result of a legitimate election and is concerned about the way his party rival is chosen. I'll say it so you don't have to, Dr. Vile. I'll Pardon. say it so you don't have to. Try to steal an election. Absolutely. You don't okay. have to say it. I have. I'll take the hate <laughs> <Okay>. comments. <laughs> steal an election. Thank you. Well, and it's it's also interesting because I've, I've been seeing in, in many of these articles and even honestly in, in the debate, going back to the debate that he had with Joe Biden, right. one of the most interesting questions that was asked very pointedly to Donald Trump was something, to, you know, as close as I can, will you accept the right. results of an election? And his response wasn't yes. His response was if it's fair. Yeah. If, it's, by his if it's correct. And, and that's the thing. In in essence, I agree with him. If it's right. fair, yeah. absolutely. That sounds normal. Yes, I would accept it if it were fair, yeah. too. But the, the trick that I think is happening is there's an, a placement as far back as, you know, the spring. They're planting the seeds for that this trip. It's already unfair. That there That's what he did no with his trial, his convictions, too. That's what he right. says about everything is, like, using the word fair as some ephemeral concept that doesn't really exist except in his like qualification of it and he uses it for everything. It's not fair. And, and you know, both Harris and Michelle Obama, well, both Obamas sort of made the point that for someone who in Ann Richardson's term for Bush was born with a silver spoon in mm-hmm. his mouth, that the person doing the most complaining is a person who, you know, was heir to a fortune and a name and good education mm-hmm. in a way that others weren't. So, and I, I, I think people are getting a little tired, you know, it, it, it's odd. Republicans for many years would accuse Democrats of playing the victim card. Mm. And now he's playing that. And it, it just doesn't sit very well when it's a billionaire complaining about how life has treated him, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I felt that way with the criminal jet, you know, his legal. Well, yeah, issues. same thing. It's, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, how, it's how many. You know, I don't we all buy it. Kid at right? School, right? Is, a fair is it, trial will go to somewhere that you are not Donald Trump and get a public defender and, and see what that looks like. If this is what's unfair, um, I think that that's a huge. Yeah, try it, being think, in a trial where you don't have money to hire your own exactly. attorney. Exactly. And, and exactly. you're, you know, you're in jail rather than out on bond. Right. Right. Or, right. you know, you don't have you don't have the Speaker of the House coming up to support you while you're on trial. Um, right. Yeah. Right. So with that, with the prior, let's talk about these electorates then. These are the the electoral college, the electors. Right. So in the past couple of elections, the popular vote has shifted. We've had a different popular vote to the electoral vote. Is that correct? Well, not the last election. Okay. But you've had two, you've had two prominent ones. Mm -hmm. One in 2000, where Gore had more popular votes and... Bush ended up winning the electoral votes very narrowly and largely as a result of a court decision. And then in 2016, and Trump denies this, but there are no political scientists that I know who would agree with him. In 2016, if I remember, there was almost a 
I want to say three million vote difference, but I could be I could be mistaken on that. But Hillary Clinton had more popular votes, but she lost the electoral vote. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that you, that people learned from that campaign, she took some states for granted. And I'm sure yeah. she probably every night, <laughs> you know, curses herself. But Wisconsin, they never, they didn't send anybody to Wisconsin that year to, to or she didn't go there. And they narrowly lost it. Mm -hmm. And that's not a mistake. You know, this year, I'm trying to remember, in 1960, Richard Nixon is said one of the major mistakes that he made is he promised that he would visit all 50 states. Mm. And that's a good thing to do if you're yeah, president. Yeah, if you can, yeah. But if you're running, I mean, we'd be glad to have people here, but there's no use visiting Tennessee. I mean, Same absent an act of God, Tennessee is going to vote Republican. And Maryland uh, and, will vote Democrat. And there's no, right, no, use, no use going to California. Uh, it's going to vote Democrat and so forth and so on. So now the strategy is we got, you know, basically the, the one thing that the seems to have states. changed is it looks like maybe North Carolina is back in the mix. Uh, Georgia, I think, is a more likely state that could go either way. But, Arizona. you know, there's some chance that, yeah. that Democrats could still win in North Carolina. So you've got about eight states left. And that's where the campaign is going to be. And you know, if you don't like this, you know, if you want to watch TV on vacation, don't go to vacation on any of these eight states <laughs> during no. the next two months. There won't be much TV. <laughs> no, there, there will be will, ads. It'll be one theme. <laughs> All right. So let's wrap it up a little bit. Um, I want to jump over to Disney. I know Chelsea's only got yeah. a few more mis minutes with us, and she's taken a look at this Disney case. And I do want to talk about that before the end. Uh, Chelsea, what in the world is, why are we talking about Disney? Okay, so let me orient us a little bit. So we are in civil law, wrongful death. You I and mean, we've done cases that are wrongful death. This is That's what we are. Our essentially, bread and butter. Yes. Essentially, what has happened is, and it's really, really unfortunate. Um, there was a couple that traveled to Disney and they the the wife, excuse me, had a very severe allergy. Um, and it seems like according to the facts, allergy, as, right? yeah, as a, yeah. as alleged in this complaint, right? Um, that she took a lot of precautions in speaking with um, the waiter and even looking ahead about possible allergens um, to, to be very cautious. Unfortunately, um, her food seemed to be contaminated with these allergens and she unfortunately passed away. So this is where in the, we're in the wrongful death world. Where this gets to be one of the wildest things I feel like I've seen on the internet in a while is that Disney responded saying that they could compel arbitration based on the fact that the husband had downloaded Disney Plus um, and, as, you know, those, like, contracts. Membership, like the, right? Membership, right. So and one it of the a free streaming trial. It was a services. free trial, and he canceled it before the free trial was up, and it's a streaming service, and how many times do you get something and, like, agree to terms and conditions, which is what he did. He was downloading it on some sort of, like, um, I'm going to sound stupid. I don't know anything about video games. I think it was an Xbox that he downloaded it onto, um, to use agree to terms and conditions, whatever, and somebody, okay, from a legal standpoint, I love creative lawyering. I say it all the time. We do. This is genius. This is, I mean, it's like diabolically genius, <laughs> but it's genius, right? They snuck in something that essentially said, I'm obviously not quoting from the exact words, that any legal, by accepting these terms and conditions, any legal claim that you could possibly have mm -hmm. against Disney um, can be forced to, to go to arbitration. Is that right? Am I explaining yeah. that correctly? <laughs> Crazy, crazy. That's an absurd thing. And so, uh, so then saying they can't sue, yes. they can't go to court for this for his for the death of his wife, yes, because he signed the membership card somewhere. Or, yes, yeah. that they're yeah, and it was a couple of years before that he, that this meant he was barred from bringing um, his complaint to court, um, which is crazy to me. Um, but now, as of there was a lot of internet backlash, um, at least on my side of the internet, um, and I believe as two days-ish ago, um, Disney has said that they are not going to proceed with that it, argument. It, it doesn't fit with the friendliest place in the world or happiest place in the world, whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> no. That and, and I get it. Like, if you had signed it on entry to the park, if you had yeah. signed it when purchasing a food pass, 
Yeah. Um, we're going on a roller coaster. We're going on one of the roller <laughs> coasters, entering the park. Then that would make sense to me of, okay, we can enforce it. We You should put it to arbitration instead yeah. of trial. But just for downloading a streaming service. I know the idea that you can waive a wrong, a death, a wrongful death claim based on one of these terms and conditions type of is crazy to me. That is a crazy thing to argue. I'm smart, but crazy. So is it going to court? Is it going to proceed then? That is my understanding that as of, like I said, two ish days ago, was that Wednesday? I don't know. Girl math. I don't know. Um, that they have withdrawn their motion, um, to dismiss the case, um, based on this, this clause, um, and given some interviews saying, sorry guys, that was mean. We're not going to do that anymore, essentially. Um, and so my understanding is that it will proceed as normal, um, through, through the civil court system. Fascinating. So legal issue versus appearance, public appearance. And Sometimes I can you... to a book that I've just read. Yes. yes. And we're going to dismiss Chelsea from here. Oh, okay. Chelsea, I know you have to go, um, but so I wanted sorry. to make sure we talked about Disney before you left. And thank, thank you. you for being here. Thanks for being here with your shirt. Don't forget to go to the lawunscripted.com. Go to the buttons for merch page. Check out our merch, our fun and interesting sayings about coffee, about lawyers, um, and about the law unscripted. But Chelsea, thanks for joining us. Um, Dr. Mm-hmm. Vile, you and I will wrap up with some of these books. I'll get out of your hair. Thank you so much for letting me jump on today. And you guys enjoy. Bye. Okay. So we should continue with the book that I just read. Yes. By Neil Gorsuch. Yes. Uh, who is a Supreme Court justice. And Janie Nitz or Nitzi. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm not sure. Um, uh, she was a clerk to him and some, uh, at least, uh, Justice uh, Sotomayor. And it's called Overrule the Human Toll of Too Much Law. Mm. And, you know, we talked, did we not, about the Chevron case? We and, did, you know, quite a bit. Deference to administrative agencies. And this explains, and Gorsuch apparently has been in league for some time with Justice Breyer and Sotomayor and maybe a couple other justices from time to time, I believe Ginsburg on one of them, where he's increasingly skeptical of the decisions that are made by government regulatory agencies. Mm. Uh, And of course, Chevron had said for many years that we're going to defer to their interpretations of the law. And he says, no, what we're ending up with are a bunch of thugs, you know, trying to go after people. And I will tell you, uh, there's a very fascinating review of this book uh, by Ruth Marcus in the, I think I got it from the I think it's from the uh, Washington Post. It may be the New York Times. She argues that he's fast and that they're fast and loose with the truth here. Oh, interesting. One one case that he cites is a case of someone who is uh, they measure the fish that he has caught and claim that some of them are below the twenty inches, uh, and then uh, they claim that he threw the fish out when they came back to remeasure, and but it. All of these people end up being caught in in decisions that often go five or ten years. And one of the points that he makes is a lot of the rules that these regulatory agencies make, and political scientists have known this for a long time, that they are actually dominated by the groups they're regulating, and particularly by the big players. And so your your big players they can navigate the rules. They have lawyers full-time who do nothing but this. And the little guy, you know, often, you know, you either pay this $10,000 fine or go to jail yeah. or we're going to hound you for the next 10 years. Yeah. And I think he makes a really good point that, you know, they're beyond, and you know, the legislature avoids problems by simply writing laws in very vague fashion so they don't have to take any blame. And the president, for the most part, cannot fire the directors of these unless they, you know, have committed severe moral turpitude or absolute incompetence. And he thinks we have this whole array of bureaucrats who are running our lives in a way that is destructive to freedom. It's a a very good read. 
I don't agree with everything that he says in here, and I'm a little cautious about it. Uh, but it explains why the court, you know, why he and others were able to to tell the court, you know, the Chevron decision. We we've, we've shown more deference than we ought to. We are there to protect individual rights, and sometimes we need to step in when these agencies exceed their bounds. Hmm. Uh, there's another interesting book, if I may mention, that of I just course. got through reading, uh, and I don't know if I'm if I'm no, if pronouncing his name right. William E. Luchtenberg, Patriot Presidents. It's about the first six presidents of the United States, and he's something of a hero um, because he has written on presidents from Roosevelt on, but he's just done these first six, and he has decided that he's going to do a series on all the presidents of the United States, but... despite the fact <laughs> that in September of 2023, he turned 101 years of age. You know, you so got to live wanna... for something. Pardon? You've got to live for something. You've got to live for something and pity the poor wife, right? Who <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finally wants to take a vacation and the guy decides that <laughs> he's probably outlived her, but you know, the guy decides at 101 that he's going to take on another major project. <laughs> you know, that's what I think of with you is I, I always figure that as long as you have a book to write, you will live. I can't because die, Because you right? have to finish it. You have well, to finish it. You know, the, it. Other, the other way to immortality is to become a U.S. senator. Ah. Uh, and have AIDS following yeah, you Feinstein around and opening and the doors for who you. Was, and, who was the guy who was there? Uh, th was uh, he South Carolina? Yes, uh, Strom Thurmond. Thurmond, yes. This like 99 or 100, and Barbara Boxer was apparently mm -hmm. fairly, not not that old, but, you know, perhaps beyond beyond her better years as she continued to serve in Congress. So. Yep, so, so write books or become yeah. senators. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Vile. It has been a very interesting conversation. Thanks for clearing up a lot about the electors, the delegates, the vice president, the president. It is very confusing in this so let's, time. Let's add one other thing so people will know, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I, I left something out. So each state, so there are 100 people voting members of the Senate. Yes. And there are 430 voting members of the House. Right. And then we have a constitutional amendment that awards three electoral votes to Washington, D.C. So you have a total of 538 electoral votes. And to win those, you need to have 270 or more. Mm. And if you don't win those, then the contest goes to the House of Representatives, Ugh. where each state has one vote. Okay. And they choose among the top three candidates, probably this year it would be, again, I think you have to have electoral votes, so it would be between the two. Um, and this has happened, it's happened twice in our history. It happened oh, wow. in 18, 1801. It took 30, I think it was either the 35th or the 36th ballot before Thomas Jefferson was chosen over his room, a running mate, Aaron Burr. Okay. And then in 1824, uh, you had a four-way election, Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Jackson had the highest number of popular votes, but he did not have a majority of electoral mm -hmm. votes. And here's what Kennedy was thinking. So in that contest, Henry Clay, who had been Speaker, maybe was at the time, Speaker of the House of Representatives, threw his support to John Quincy Adams, uh -huh. who then appointed him as Secretary of State. And Jackson immediately said that was a corrupt bargain, and he ran on that. And in 1828, he was selected as the president in a, in a rematch with John Quincy Adams. Oh, fascinating. Okay. I definitely did not know that. So good information to have. Glad well, it's on it the record. It helps when you've lived through these things, you know. <laughs> At eighteen oh one, at eighteen oh one, I was on my seat the whole, the whole time. <laughs> you my seat. I love it. Well, thank you for walking us through the constitutional details and the historical ones. Look forward to talking next week, seeing what's happening with politics and with the legal side of it. So hopefully we can talk about the things that you don't know and no one's ever told you, um, that we can clear things up and be that maybe voice of reason, though. Me as a voice of reason, I don't know. Maybe you. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can see us and um, get our show out to others who would possibly enjoy the show, and especially to law students who are going through law school and trying to learn the fundamentals like we are, um, we have all had to do and are still learning. Life, I think, is a lifetime of learning. I certainly never stop, but enjoy the rest of your week. Happy Friday, happy, happy hour, and we will catch you next time on The Legal Weekly Wine.